And now I'd like to invite Barbara, but first a word to say thank you, Barbara, for your presence with us. Barbara is very special to us at York Minster Park. She has been here many times as a guest preacher and is a dear friend of this church. And she's been serving for the last 17 years, and she serves, continues to serve on the faculty of Cary Hall at the, it's sort of in between the Vancouver School of Theology and Regent College. Yeah, Isn't, sure. Is that fair to say? Sure. And um, it, it's the Baptist Seminary at UBC, and uh, she has been really uh, one of the key people in that place for us as a denomination, and she has blessed our denomination, not just this church, but blessed our denomination in many ways with her leadership, but above all in preparing um, women and men for ministry in our denomination over the years. Thank you. So thank you, and uh, God bless you. It's been such a pleasure, such an honor and a delight to be with you these past couple of days. I, I thank you for the invitation and for your kindness and hospitality and in engagement and conversation. It's been rich for me. What does it mean to preach? What is it that we are doing when we sit with the text and walk with the people and then stand and try to bring them together, people and text. Try to bring them toward each other for comfort and courage and so that somehow in the doing we may all become a little bit more like Jesus. Preaching creates so many questions, doesn't it? Is this sermon going to bring people hope? Will it build up the community of faith? Will it be true to the experience of the hearers? Will they be able to find themselves in it, their boredom, their desire, their fears? Will it point them to what God is already doing in the world? Will it speak of both trouble and grace? Will it help them know who and whose they are and what the world could be? How might this sermon become homiletics or literally a conversation with a crowd? For that matter, there are all those questions about the text itself. What is the text doing? What different way and different world are contained in these ancient words? What symbols are being offered in the text? What are the practices and the identity we are being asked to take up? What reality requires our attention and our relationship? Barbara Brown Taylor, known, I expect, to all of us, the Episcopal priest whose little country church became so disrupted with visitors after her preaching gained such attention that she had to leave the church, approaches preaching like this. For me, she says, to preach is first of all to immerse myself in the word of God, to look inside every sentence and underneath every phrase for the layers of meaning that have accumulated over the centuries. It is to examine my own life and the life of the congregation with the same care, hunting the connections between the word on the page and the word at work in the world. It is to find my own words for bringing those connections to life so that others can experience them for themselves. When that happens, when the act of preaching becomes a source of revelation for me, as well as for those who listen to me, then the good news every sermon proclaims is that the God who acted is the God who acts, and that the Holy Spirit is alive and well in the world. What does it mean to preach? Is it simply truth through personality, as Phillips Brooks, preacher to Harvard University, said in 1877? Or is it the dangerous and demanding work of speaking truth to power, as has been described in our time by Walter Brueggemann? Or is it all of this and more, truth through personality and truth to power, but also truth to the wounded, to the broken, to the longing and to the lost? What does it mean to preach? And what might a text such as Colossians chapter 1 verse 24 through chapter 2 verse 5 
have to offer our conversation. Perhaps you would turn with me to our text for this morning, Colossians 1.24. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. And in my flesh, I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known. The mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations, but has now been revealed to his saints. To them, God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. It is he whom we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone in all wisdom so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. For I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I am saying this so that no one may deceive you with plausible arguments. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. This is the word of the Lord. In so many ways, this text could not be farther from our experience. We do not have apostolic authority. We're not writing from prison. And we're not unknown to nor absent from our congregations. Yet we know what it means to work hard. Hard work is at the heart of this text. It's at the center of the little chiastic structure. At the very center, chapter 129 and 2, verse 1. For this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. For I want you to know how much I am struggling for you and for those in Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face. Strenuously contend, strive, labor, toil, or struggle it appears that the work of ministry, specifically nurturing mature, Christ-formed followers through the ministry of the word, requires as much effort as training for the Olympics. Norman MacLean, son of a clergyman and author of the beautiful little novella, A River Runs Through It, said, my father was very sure about certain matters pertaining to the universe. To him, all good things, trout as well as eternal salvation, come by grace, and grace comes by art, and art does not come easy. Preaching is hard work for oh so many reasons, is it not? It's hard because we live in a world in which there is a crisis of speaking and hearing, turning and turning in the widening gyre, you know these words. The falcon cannot hear the falconer. Things fall apart. The center cannot hold. Mere anarchy is loosed upon the world. The blood-dimmed tide is loosed, and everywhere the ceremony of innocence is drowned. It's been said I've heard it said by the media that in these last week, 10 days, that Canada has lost her innocence should we have had some. The best lack all conviction, while the worst are full of passionate intensity. Richard Lisher, professor of preaching at Duke Divinity School, in reference to this poem 
written in 1919 at the end of World War I, the Great War, said William Butler Yeats sounds the first modern alarm that whoever has a serious vocation in language and proposes to communicate from depth to depth will be in trouble. Even preachers will say there, thus says the Lord's, in disintegrating circumstances. Even they will speak against the grain of their environment among people with a diminished capacity to hear. And 25 years later, in the last few weeks of Nazi Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer wrote from his prison cell, the time when people could be told everything by means of words, whether theological or pious, is over. But the problem deepens. There is not only a diminished capacity to hear, there may simply be too many words. I think, was it um, Salieri who said of Mozart in Amadea, there's just too many notes. Well, it's hard to be said about Mozart, but perhaps we have too many words. There are many words. The English language has over a million words. And the average North American is subjected to somewhere between, I've seen both statistics, 3,000 as perhaps as high as 6,000 messages every day. And in order to make sense of such an onslaught of words and messages, we know we're understanding that our brains are learning to read differently. Less and less do we read in order to inhabit a world or to be transformed. Like water striders, we skim the pond, the surface. And because information is being presented electronically in shorter and tighter bites, we discover our, ourselves skimming writing that has already been dramatically condensed. We are an attention deficit people, and it diminishes severely the ways in which we read and think and listen. And it may be something of a direct corollary that the inflation of daily messages is leading to an erosion of words themselves. Wendell Berry observes that the two epidemic illnesses of our time, the disintegration of communities and the disintegration of persons, are closely related to the disintegration of language. And that, what we have seen, he says, for perhaps 150 years, is a gradual increase in language that is either meaningless or destructive of meaning. What is our task as a logocentric people if not to cherish the word? This is the question asked by Marilyn Chandler McIntyre in her beautiful little book called Caring for Words in a Culture of Lies. What is our task as a word-centric, logocentric people if not to cherish the word and words? How can we learn to use words as instruments of compassion, of instruments of grace, of truth, and of love? Preaching is hard because there's a crisis in hearing and in speaking. Preaching is also hard because it's devalued. Lischer says it has no functional equivalence in secular culture. Preaching cannot be camouflaged among socially useful or acceptable activities. In fact, in the Webster Dictionary, offered as the second meaning of preach is to give moral or religious advice, especially in a tiresome manner. <laughs> and while clergy roles became professionalized and maybe rose a bit in esteem about 100 years ago, and for a season were held in a measure of social esteem, I understand, similar to that of medical doctors or lawyers or engineers, the cultural stock of clergy has declined dramatically since then. You, you know this to be true. I encountered this myself one day when remarking slightly that, you know, one day I might leave teaching and return to uh, congregational life and service, to which the well-meaning person to whom I was speaking in lightly masked horror and complete bafflement said, why would you do that? It's like this was a, a downward path she assumed. This was representing an unchurched world. 
In Morgan's Passing, a quirky little novel by Ann Tyler, uh, Morgan, the protagonist, moves through the streets of Baltimore impersonating various professionals. So one day he is walking down a suburban street in Baltimore and sees a, a puppet play being performed on the lawn of a church in the neighborhood. And there's a husband and wife who are the puppeteers and they're behind the little waist-high stage and they're performing for the children and in a way that can only happen in a novel, um, the woman immediately and instantly goes into labor and is going to have a baby at that moment, the, mo the woman puppeteer. And from behind the puppet stage, you hear the cry, you know, is there a doctor in the, in the crowd? And no one comes forward. There isn't a doctor in the crowd. But Morgan is there, and he kind of drifts forward, and with incredible calm, he takes charge, and he bundles up the laboring uh, puppeteer wife into the back seat of his station wagon, and he directs the husband, who's very anxious to drive immediately to the closest hospital. He gets in the back with the laboring puppeteer wife, who, of course, delivers the baby en route to the hospital. Clearly not a first baby. Um, and he's marvelous. He does everything that needs to be done. And this baby is born healthy, and the husband pulls up, and they, the medical professionals come out, and they whisk the couple away, and Morgan drifts away. And the couple look for him through the medical records, and they can find no record of a Dr. Morgan. They had, they had a name for him. And months go by, they have searched, and they have finally given up, but months go by, they're pushing their stroller and this now eight-month-old child down the street, and they encounter Morgan on the street. And they say, oh, Dr. Morgan, we've been looking all over for you. The hospital has kept terrible records. They have no sign of rec record of your employment, and we're so sorry we wanted to thank you for delivering our child and perhaps saving two of our three family member lives. And he said, oh, I'm, s I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry. <laughs> I'm actually not a physician. And it turns out, comes out in the conversation, that he has also impersonated a lawyer and a clergyman. But he says, I could never imitate a butcher or a plumber. They'd find me out in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> Preaching is devalued. The pastoral life doesn't have a recognizable equivalent. But preaching is also hard because we are so easily seduced by technology as the new symbol of power. And when we preach, all we have are words. We have tried valiantly in preaching to be relevant, to be interesting, to respond to what we think is required for effective communication to take place thinking that the use of technology will somehow ensure that the message is received. And turning to various forms of media for assistance, we strive to keep people with us when we speak. But did you know that when the brain is asked to multitask, or multi-botch, as friends of mine say, by listening and watching at the same time, the brain quits listening and the spoken word, which possesses the greatest potential for communication in depth, when the sound is turned off, the discourse moves quickly to the surface. And what we bear witness to through preaching is a complex relationship between God and God's creation, a relationship that includes ambiguity and suffering and hope. That includes, as we were reminded last night, a risky partnership between God and God's creation that is played out on the scene and on the terrain, as Danielle reminded us yesterday afternoon, of a sacred cartography. These profound questions of meaning cannot be answered by a series of talking points. Preaching names things. It builds meaning. It re-scripts. It brings a world into focus and large, and carefully nuanced endeavors such as these cannot be reduced to a series of bullet points projected on a screen. Think about Job and the questions that he received in return to his own question of why, the most urgent of questions in human experience. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? 
Look at Behemoth. Can you draw out Leviathan? These deepest of human truths and divine truths resist being reduced, must simply be pointed to and lived toward. Look at the lilies. A certain man had two sons. Can't be reduced. Preaching is hard because, convinced of the primacy of technology, we are reluctant to trust the words that are ours to use. How might our preaching and our congregational lives and the world be different if we set ourselves the hard and amazingly challenging and I believe satisfying work of attempting and striving to learn to use words as instruments of love and compassion. And if that's not enough, preaching is hard work because it is spiritual labor. This is at least part of what Paul is referring to when he speaks of his toil and struggle. He uses language this way elsewhere in this letter. In chapter 1, verse 9, he writes, For this reason, since the day we heard it, we have not ceased praying for you. And in chapter 4, verse 12, he tells the Colossians that Epaphras is always wrestling in his prayers on their behalf. Remember the words that Barbara Brown Taylor used, immersing ourselves in the word of God, looking inside every sentence and underneath every phrase, hunting the connection between the words on the page and the word at work in the world, examining our own life and that of our congregation and finding our own words. Preaching is hard work. It is delivered in a world in which preaching is devalued to people who find it hard to listen by women and men who are understandably reluctant to trust the spoken word and who are more strangers to prayer than we would care to admit. But here's the good news. Preaching is not only hard work. Preaching is holy work because it is the thing that God does speaks a word and a world is formed. And this is the thing that preachers do, bring a world into focus. I, I never had quite imagined that I would have the opportunity to say thank you to Walter Brueggemann personally, whose writing has influenced me probably more than any other single voice when it comes to scripture studies. It's been large and important, and I can't I can't open my mouth to, to come to an Old Testament text or to think about preaching without. So thank you from me, and, and I expect from us all, but thank you. You have contributed some of the most significant work in, in my experience and estimation on preaching over the past number of years, long time, in my lifetime. You declare that the task of the preacher is to lead the church in situating its daily life with all of the ambiguities in the sweep of the great God story of creation and consummation and covenant, of orientation and disorientation and reorientation, of the plot, the great plot, as you spoke of it last night. And Walter has said the plot of creation, covenant, consummation, that the preacher works day by day, week by week, and text by text, situates lived human crises in relation to large evangelical claims and that the linkage between the immediate and the deep. Creation, he says, is the claim that the life of the world is bounded by the self-giving generosity of God. And consummation is the claim of the text that the life of the world is bounded by God's utterly reliable fidelity and covenant is the claim of the text that the current life of the world is intimately and determinedly held in relation to God's good governance. That's the landscape of preaching. That's what we do when we bring people and text together. We bear witness to the sweeping narrative of creation, consummation, covenant, and into this landscape we place life as we know it 
the problems that permeate our experience and the needs of our world. We speak our fears for the economy and our children and our health. Our disillusionments with the churches, our relationships, our lives with God, our addictions and our regrets and our shame. P.T. Forsyth said that the cure for pulpit dullness is not brilliance, but reality, more reality. Into the reality of human experience, the preacher has the privilege and the responsibility to speak into existence an alternative world, a good news world, one that is face to face with that which is most difficult, most destructive, most despairing, but into that real world to speak the good news, to offer a truer story than the story of fear that twists, twisty turny, Danielle, you said, that twists our perspectives, to remind God's people who and whose we are. The defining mark of this truer, true-est world is always the God who is unfailingly for us, who comes to us in the person of Jesus. It takes time, and I think a great deal of patience and not a little skill, but lots of time to make the story known, to allow this one true tale to be the one that shapes our world, to allow the great God's story to remind us and to form in us the identity of who and whose we truly are. Contrary to much Protestant theology, says Richard Lisher, the gospel does not consist in a few riveting pronouncements from the pulpit. The word of God usually does not knife through history and impale its hearers on their own inauthentic existence. The ministry of the word, he says, is an endless card game played out among people who never stop talking with and caring for one another. And Jonathan Wilson Hartgrove, son-in-law to my colleague Jonathan, in Jonathan's book, New Monasticism, writes something that to me speaks of some of the beauty of what is possible in congregational life. He says, what I really want to name is the work that we most need to be doing, tending the good gift of a culture of grace. It is enough to get the love of God into your bones and to live as if you are forgiven. It is enough to care for each other, to forgive each other, and to wash the dishes. The rest of life is details. It's not that there isn't work to be done all the way down to washing the dishes, but grace means that there is enough time and love and patience and forgiveness to bear with one another as we struggle to do the good work God has called us to do. You can't make a community grow. All you can do is to tend to a culture of grace and truth by listening to every voice, loving people who frustrate you, telling the truth as best you can, and doing the dishes. And because preaching is hard work, and because it takes a lifetime to tend a culture, the preaching life must be supported by a spirituality that has the capacity to sustain the hard work and the effort. Coming back to that verse at the heart of the text, for this I toil and struggle with all the energy that he powerfully inspires within me. So what forms an adequate spirituality for the hard work of the preaching life? 20 plus years ago, I was pastoring full time, finishing some academic work, along with my husband parenting small children, trying to be a good enough daughter to my recently widowed mother, and expending more energy than I was replacing in every area of my life. I had been at the church then 10 years, and I loved it. I loved that congregation. I had been loved into an understanding of ministry and service by them. But I could not see my way forward for a lot longer without some kind of change. And I had read Eugene Peterson for a number of years by then, and I had been shaped by the vision of a long obedience in the same direction. And I knew that he had been at his church for 20 years or more by that point, 
And he, I, I knew and I figured and imagination, imagined that he had to have felt some version of how I was feeling at some point. And I found myself on a particular afternoon in Regina, Saskatchewan, asking director assistance, because that's how we used to have to do it, for the number of Christ the King Bel Air Presbyterian Church, or in Bel Air, Maryland, and found myself asking a receptionist to speak to Eugene Peterson. I, this wasn't the sort of thing I normally did. And she impossibly answered with these words, oh, he doesn't work here anymore. She must have heard the breath escaping on the other end of the phone. She gave me the number for Pittsburgh Theological Seminary where he was, and acting, forcing myself on before I could lose my nerve, I called, expecting a second receptionist, but instead hearing this husky male, somewhere past middle-aged voice, answering the phone saying, this is Eugene. And at that point, I mostly wanted to blurt out, why aren't you still at your church? But instead, I said something about loving my church and running out of energy, and then I pretty much ran out of words. And the same voice said something profoundly simple, something I'm sure I should have been able to figure out on my own, but I hadn't. And I expect he also said another thing or two, but the thing I remember, and I hope I never forget, he said, you have to find a spirituality that will sustain you. And he was right. Ministry in general, and the preaching life in particular, feels long and hard because it is long and hard. And all the energy that we expend through the hard work that is preaching must be inspired or breathed back into us through the Spirit of God, through a Spirit-formed spirituality that sustains. And such a spirituality might take the form of a weekly Sabbath, the beautifully phrased architecture in time, as Heschel describes it. Or it might take the form of the Benedictine spirituality founded on the conviction that within every 24 hours, we have been given enough time for work and worship and study and play. Or it might be another set of rhythms and structures and practices altogether, whatever form it takes for you. Such a spirituality will undoubtedly hold certain practices in tension, for truth is most often found in paradox. Contemplation and action, silence and words, soul friendship and solitude, repentance and celebration. The point is, look after your soul. Do whatever it takes to let God love you and to learn to consent to divine love and then do it again tomorrow and the next day. It's not an easy thing being a servant of the church, to use the apostle's language. So much about the preaching life is hard. But located smack in the midst of the toil and struggle is the promise and the proclamation of the firstborn of all creation, the head of the body, the church, the beginning the firstborn from the dead, the one in whom all the fullness of God is pleased to dwell, that this God will breathe into us all the energy that we need. So, preaching is hard. You already knew that. In the structure of the Colossians text, both the hard work and the energizing spirituality are all for the sake of proclaiming Christ. Preaching is all about the mystery of Jesus. Let's look at the text again, verse 25. I became its servant according to God's commission that was given to me for you to make the word of God fully known, the mystery that has been hidden throughout the ages and generations but has now been revealed to his saints. And then I'm going to move over to verse 2. I want their hearts to be encouraged and united in love so that they may have all the riches of assured understanding and have the knowledge of God's mystery, that is, Christ himself, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Preaching is all about the mystery of Jesus. 
It's not precisely the mystery of which Bruce Coburn sings, moon over junkyard where the snow lies bright, can set my heart to burn. Don't tell me there's no mystery. It overflows my cup. It's not quite that, although he's on the road. The kind of mystery of which Paul writes is mystery as in something we could not have known unless it was shown to us, specifically the free admission of the Gentiles on equal privileges of the covenant. For this truth, for this wonder, for this mystery, Paul is a prisoner. And in this, God most lavishly describes God's goodness. The mystery the Messiah reveals is that this full image-bearing of God, this glory, will be found among both Gentiles and Jews, breaking down the ethnic divisions that have led to people's continued oppression of each other. The mystery is all about reconciliation. Not Christ only, as if that were not enough, but Christ given freely to the Gentiles also. At the center of the mystery shines the revelation that God's purposes are not restricted. God's purposes do not exclude. God's purposes embrace the whole world. In Jesus, God turns toward all peoples, and in Jesus, God is for us. Mystery in the name and person of Christ resides at the heart of the story of God. From the beginning of time, all that God has planned to do, God has done and is doing in Christ for the sake of all people. There is astonishment here in Paul's writing. How could it be otherwise? And perhaps only artists and poets can offer a response that is appropriate to the wonder. I believe that Mary Oliver, American poet, gets it more frequently than many. She writes, when death comes, like a hungry bear in autumn, when death comes and takes all the bright coins from his purse to buy me and snaps the purse shut, when death comes like the measle pox, when death comes like an iceberg through the shoulder blades, I want to step through the door full of curiosity, wondering what is it going to be like, that cottage of darkness, and therefore, I look upon everything as a brotherhood and a sisterhood. And I look upon time as no more than an idea. And I think of each life as a flower, as common as a field daisy, and as singular. And each name a comfortable music in the mouth, tending as all music does towards silence. And each body a lion of courage and something precious to the earth. When it's over, I want to say, all my life I was a bride married to amazement. I was the bridegroom taking the world into my arms. When it is over, I don't want to wonder if I've, I've made something of my life that is particular and real. I don't want to find myself sighing and frightened or full of argument. I don't want to end up simply having visited the world. What if our preaching took more opportunity to point toward mystery? What if our preaching acknowledged more frequently the wonder that lies at the heart of creation and with which every ounce of God's dealings are shot through and through? Our jobs are not to make it smaller. Job wanted answers. He got questions and God. Only one response can maintain us, wrote Abraham Joshua Heschel. Gratefulness for witnessing the wonder, for the gift of our unearned right to serve, to adore, and to fulfill. It is gratefulness that makes the soul great. And here is a mystery of only slightly less order. The wonder that God shows up more times than not in the ancient, non-technological act of preaching. The holy otherness of God who nonetheless wills to become known in preaching and who through Christ reconciles the world to God's self. 
Or, as John Donne wrote, here in the ordinance of preaching, God delivers himself to us. What if we approach the preaching life determined to not reduce the mystery of the great good news, the wonder of what God in Christ is doing? What if we saw as central to our work learning to be astonished and cultivating gratitude? The preaching life is hard and requires a sustaining spirituality that nurtures our consent to God's love. It's probably not about half the things that we think it is, but it is always and centrally about the glory of this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. And finally, every part of it, every part of the preaching and the preaching life is wrapped up in the dual experiences of suffering and rejoicing. Let's look at the beginning and the ending of the passage, verse 24. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions for the sake of his body, that is, the church. And verse 5 of chapter 2. For though I am absent in body, yet I am with you in spirit, and I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. It's easy to get stuck on the first ten words in the text. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake. It's true that the way of Jesus surely leads to a cross. The biblical narrative is the story of a suffering God who will stop at nothing to reconcile a broken world. W. H. Vanstone wrote, Love that gives, gives evermore, gives with zeal, with eager hands, spares not, keeps not, all outpours, ventures all, its all expends. Drained is love in making full, bound in making others free, poor in making many rich, weak in giving power to be. Therefore, he who shows us God, helpless, hangs upon the tree, and the nails and crown of thorns tell of what God's love must be. Here is God, no monarchy, throned in easy state to reign. Here is God, whose arms of love, aching, spent, the world sustain. To make this story our story is to embrace a tale that includes suffering. I've deeply appreciated the words of Brian Walsh, who says that entering the story of the suffering God, following the Messiah who brings peace through the blood of the cross by sharing in his suffering, we, the community, learn to bear the image of that God and that Messiah, and in that way alone, become mature, complete, and whole in Christ. But though it is clearly part of the story, suffering in this text does not get the last word. At one point in Frederick Buechner's The Final Beast, Nicolet is trying to collect his thoughts for the next Sunday sermon, but events and people keep crowding in as they do. And after a few jottings, he finally crossed out what he has written and in block letters across the page on which he'd been writing, wrote the words, is it true? And then he thought, was that secretly what they came to find out Sunday after Sunday, just that, yes or no? That's the question, he thought, that you avoid like death or perhaps even more like life. And then Nicolet imagines what he might say in his sermon if he had the nerve to really say it. Beloved, don't believe I preach the best without knowing the worst. I know it, beloved. But the worst thing isn't the last thing about the world. It's the next to the last thing. The last thing is the best. It's the power that from on high that comes down into the world that wells up from the rock bottom of the world like a hidden spring. Can you believe it? The last best thing is the laughing deep in the heart of saints, sometimes our hearts even. Yes, 
You are terribly loved and forgiven. Yes, you are healed. All is well. The preaching life, birthed in the life of the community, is always for hope. It's always for courage. It's always for love. I rejoice to see your morale and the firmness of your faith in Christ. It is for the life of the community. We are not preaching for individual transformation, though that may and will happen, but for the life of the community and for the good of the world in which we have been placed. And all of it, every single bit, the hard work and the suffering, all the preaching and all the prayer, is for Christ in you, Christ in your people, Christ in our congregations, Christ in the world eventually, the hope of glory. It is all for courage and love. So hard work, yes, yes. <laughs> hard work that points to mystery and stands back in amazement and wonder and tries to live into it and then tries again and again. And hard work that is embraced by both suffering and rejoicing, the preaching task. Now in the words of an Irish blessing. May the blessings released through your hands Oh, just wait. <laughs> Once in a while, in my tradition, I have seen people and I've been taught and have learned when receiving a blessing, it's awfully good practice to put your hands out so that you can catch it. So, would you? May the blessings released through your hands cause windows to open in darkened minds. May the sufferings your calling brings be but winter before the spring. May the companionship of your doubt restore what your beliefs leave out. May the secret hungers of your heart harvest from emptiness its sacred fruit. May your solitude be but a voyage into the wilderness and the wonder of God. May you find words of divine warmth to clothe the dying in the language of dawn. And may the slow light of the table of God be a sure shelter around your future, both now and forever. Amen. Thank you.